Hi, this is Susan Matias again at Carolina Raptor Center. Today I would like to talk to you about anesthesia in a little bit more detail. We've covered it a little bit when we did imping, for instance, but it's such a cool process. I want to show you some details about this. So why do we anesthetize birds? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, a bird might uh, have a, a wound when it comes in. Lots of our patients, yeah, yes, <laughs> Igor, he's happening to Igor is a turkey vulture, as you can tell. He's got a red face, white beak. Um, so Igor might have a wound, and if you've ever had any injuries yourself, you know that it's going to be painful. So to have a doctor work on your arm or leg on a wound without anesthesia, without pain meds, would be really difficult. Um, so we try to anesthetize them lightly when they do uh, when we do wound care. Um, we do this obviously when they need a radiograph. So we lay them down. I think we've seen this before in the past. Um, when they need surgery, so Dr. Scott repairs lots of long bone fractures, for instance. They obviously need to be very deep under anesthesia for that to happen. Otherwise, they're struggling the entire time. Things are moving. It's, it would not be a good situation. And then even during physical therapy, so if Igor, for instance, had a broken wing that was repaired surgically every couple of days, he would come here and get anesthesia um, in order to be calm and basically out of it so we can stretch his wing or stretch his leg, whatever the appropriate limbs, to make sure he gets full range of motion. So really any procedure that is stressful on the bird or painful on the bird, we're going to try to anesthetize if we can. It's really important, and it's a very safe procedure. We do literally hundreds of these every year, and it's extremely rare to have a problem. But I'll mention some of the problems we have. So before we can anesthetize Igor, for instance, we have to make sure that his crop is empty. So <laughs> some birds of prey have crops. That includes vultures, hawks, eagles. Most species you think about, the exception are owls. Owls do not have a crop. And why do we care about this? Um, so if there's food sitting right here in the neck or the upper part of the stomach or the crop, and we lay the bird down to be anesthetized, that food could easily leak up and into the uh, trachea. It's called could aspiration. You, could you describe a little bit what a crop is and why birds have it? A crop, yes. So a crop is basically like a pouch. So they have the esophagus, basically a tube that food so it goes down, that you swallow through, goes down into the stomach. That tube is very stretchy, very elastic, but in some species, in many species, it actually has almost like a pouch-like structure. Um, so they can store lots of extra food, and that could be important for some species. For instance, think about lots of vultures congregating on a dead animal. If, you're the, if you can't store a lot of food, you're gonna get a very small share of food. But if you can store a lot of food very quickly and then fly off and digest it sitting on a tree somewhere, that's to your advantage. So lots of birds have that adaptation to be able to eat quickly and get away from potentially dangerous situations, such as sitting on the ground, which is kind of an unnatural place for raptors to be. They always want to be up high. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so before we can anesthetize Igor, we can make sure he hasn't eaten recently. If he has a full crop, we literally just have to wait. It might be eight hours before we can do this. So in some cases, we have to plan ahead a day to make sure that Igor doesn't get a meal early in the morning so we can anesthetize him by the afternoon, for instance. Um, so uh, then we uh, basically what we'll do is we can, in some cases, uh, start intubating with the bird vertical. It's kind of a more natural position. So we literally put their heads in this cone we have different sizes, so a small bird get a smaller cone, a bigger bird has a bigger cone, and then we make it as airtight as we can. We don't want this uh, gas to escape and affect us. So are those masks, are they specifically made for raptors? They are not. These are made for cats and dogs. They're standard veterinary masks. They make different sizes. They make even longer skinny ones, which uh, sometimes work better for raptors. But that's just a standard veterinary product. We have modified it somewhat with this ring of, of uh, bandage material that makes the opening a little smaller so we can get the tightest possible fit around the neck so gas does not leak out. And then basically they get two, and we'll, in most cases we will lay him down. So either it's going to be comfortable, well not yet comfortable. At this point he's still awake. 
I'm just putting this cone in there. In many cases, we're going to put a towel over this cone so he's in the dark. Remember that raptors are very visual creatures, so cutting down on visual acuity, uh, visual um, stimulus. stress stimulus mm -hmm. will be very helpful to calm them down just a little bit. Meanwhile, somebody is still holding Igor down. He is just laying here. And we're going to turn to our anesthesia machine. So there are two components. One is an oxygen flow meter. And the amount of oxygen they need depends on the body weight. So we have to have a current weight on our friend in kilograms. So for instance, if Igor was going to weigh one kilogram, I would turn this dial. It's turned off, unfortunately, until the bubble rises to one. That's one liter per minute per kilogram of body weight. So that's my first step, oxygen. And the second step would be to turn on the gas. So by itself, oxygen obviously does not anesthetize the bird. But here I've got a gas flow meter, and this is 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, 5%. This will be the highest you would ever use. Typically, we use about 3% from most birds to maintain them, and even lower. The lower the amount, the better for the bird, because there is a slight risk involved. But if you put them too deep, you could literally, well, you could euthanize a bird. So 5% is very unlikely to be ever used for a normal procedure. Um, how long does it take for them to go to sleep? Anywhere from 5 to 10 minutes. And mm -hmm. they're going to start relaxing. Uh, the heart rate slows down. So the normal heart rate on a raptor could be anywhere between two and 300 or more. The smaller the bird, the higher the heart rate. So we will start listening to the heart rate using either a normal stethoscope or, in some cases, an esophageal stethoscope. This actually goes down in the esophagus, so down the tube that you, that you eat through, basically. Close enough to the heart, we can listen to the heart through this instrument, which is pretty cool. So what are you listening for when you listen to the heart? Um, so I'm not an expert in terms of monitoring, but basically I'm just counting heartbeats. So let's see, count um, for 10 seconds, let's say, count the heartbeats, and then multiply by six, and then you get the heart rate per minute. So I'm counting as the bird is getting deeper into anesthesia, make sure the heart rate goes down. We like it to go down to maybe to 100, to between 100 and 150 would be about normal. Mm -hmm. Lower than that, we'd be a little bit concerned about that. Maybe there's a problem with this bird. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have to abort missions, basically, because the bird is not reacting well. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they're too weak. So even brand new birds just admitted sometimes to be anesthetized, and they're obviously not in great shape sometimes. Sometimes their body can't handle that kind of stress and we have to stop everything and wake them back up right away. Mm -hmm. So we listen to the heart and we also watch the respirations. And we'll talk about breathing a little bit more in detail in just a second, but um, basically the chest will expand and we're just gonna watch that. And it's gonna be very quickly at first because they're wide awake, stressed out, they know what's going on. As they relax, breathing is gonna get deeper and slower until we're down to maybe 15 to 20 respirations per minute. That would be our goal, roughly. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, all the while, this is what, whatever we're doing to the bird, whether it's anesthesia, uh, wound care, surgery, somebody's always monitoring this bird. That would be the assistant's job while the doctor is performing surgery, whatever needs to be done. Somebody's always keeping an eye on this. we we'll constantly adjust the gas to keep them as low as possible, again, to reduce the risk of, of injury. Um, and then once the procedure is over, then we'll start recovery, which means we basically turn this off. So no more anesthetic gas, but we still have the oxygen flowing, which isn't showing here, of course, right now, but my little ball here would be still at the one. Mm -hmm. So we want to get pure oxygen, not pure oxygen, 3% oxygen, let's say, in there, um, to get all the excess anesthetic gas out of the system as quickly as possible. And they have a very efficient system, we'll talk about it in a minute. So what are the signs that minutes. they're starting to wake up? Um, so they're going to start stiffening, whereas right now he would be very relaxed. Um, everything's just kind of flopped over. Uh, the legs will start to stiffen and contract. The wings will probably fold back in and they even start trembling a little bit. Um, so the whole bird will get stiffer. They'll have an eye reflex again, a corneal reflex. Um, the eyes might also um, open up. Sometimes the eyelids, in most birds, the eyelids will close when they're asleep. Um, so it'll be pretty obvious. Within a couple of minutes, 
five minutes easily. They'll be at least wait, awake enough to come out of this chamber and then be held by someone. And again, we'll do it vertically because that's more of a natural position for them as soon as we can. And then spend the rest of the recovery just held vertical until they're awake enough so we can put them back in their cage and they're not going to fall over and flop around on the ground. So is this the same um, thing that is used in hospitals for people? Um, it probably is. I know it's this very similar setup to veterinary hospitals. I don't know if people anesthetic machines for, for humans are similar, but I imagine the principle is probably the same. Mm -hmm. You're breathing in gas till you're asleep, they monitor you, they probably have, they have, in fact, I know they have many more advanced monitoring techniques than we do, um, but the basics are the same, yes. Mm -hmm. I believe that's right. All right, so let's walk over to our screen for just a minute. I want to show you something about the respiratory system. Let me get let Kristen come into position. Mm -hmm. um, so birds are um, very efficient when it comes to respiration, and they really have to be because they have a much higher metabolism and think about what they have to do. They're lifting their whole body off the ground into the air, flying sometimes very fast or very far. They just they have to be more efficient than we are. And so I found a cool website here uh, that talks about the difference between our respiratory system, people, versus birds. Um, so in us, basically we have kind of a cul-de-sac system. It's a two-way street. So you can see, follow this, this uh, animation, you see the yellow coming in, that's fresh air coming into the lungs. The chest expands because we have a, a muscle across the bottom between the chest and the abdomen called the diaphragm that kind of pushes up and down. That's what helps expand the lungs. So within the lungs, the oxygen is exchanged into the bloodstream and carbon dioxide is expelled. And then with every breath, the red part there that's carbon dioxide waste product that's expelled from the body. So fresh air comes in, stale air goes out with oxygen, and some of the oxygen obviously is transferred to the body. Our system is fairly inefficient. That's one of the reasons why we can give mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, right? Because we have enough oxygen left in our breath when it comes out to still be useful for someone else. Same is not true for birds. They're much more efficient, so if they were going to do mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, they really couldn't help their patient uh, because there's not enough oxygen in there. So if we scroll down, so birds have an entirely different system here. Let me talk about the anatomy a little bit. Um, so obviously they're breathing in just like us. Yellow air comes in, but in addition to lungs, they also have air sacs. They have probably at least nine air sacs. There's four pairs some in the back of the body, some in the front, um, some up near the neck region, some in fact going up into the neck, and some, in some cases the bones themselves are connected to the air sacs. And the reason is that they want as much volume as possible. The more air you can inhale, the more oxygen you can inhale at the same time. So to be efficient, they just increase the volume of air they can breathe in. But more than that, what they're doing is with every breath, with intake and with the outtake, they're actually exchanging oxygen. Because it takes them two full breaths to get rid of the old air. In our system, fresh air comes down and the old air goes out, but because it's a one-way one -way street, so to speak, there's always stale air left. That's one of the inefficiencies. Here, there's no stale air left because as it comes in, Fresh air goes into some air sacs first, and then it slowly exchanges. You see how long this takes from yellow to red here, and then goes out through other air sacs and eventually back out. So it takes them two breaths to process the air. Basically makes them at least twice as efficient. We would have to take two breaths for every one that a bird takes to, to be able to transfer that much oxygen into our bloodstream. So that's an automatic improvement right there over our system. Um, so and that's all birds, not just raptors? That's all birds, as far as I know. They all mm -hmm. have this type of system with air sacs, um, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. um, 
One of the things we have to watch out for is these guys do not have a diaphragm like we have. Um, so when they breathe, just like in us to some extent, their entire chest cavity has to be able to expand and contract. Um, so if you're holding a bird too tight, you can literally prevent them from breathing. Whereas in us, you still have a muscle that can do some of the breathing for you. They can't do that. So we have to be careful when we handle them for any day, any procedure, really, that we're never squeezing their body very hard. So it's, it's a delicate balance holding on tight enough so that the bird doesn't get loose and fly around in the building, but not too tight so they can still breathe. Wow. Okay? Um, so they have a really cool, and there are also all, all kinds of other details in how they are exchanging oxygen. So are, so are the air sacs like just kind of like balloons inside their body? They are basically body? just storage, yes. Mm -hmm. Lots more volume of air can come in, and then they're constricted with muscle action to force the air through the system and back out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically you're having an extra lung with you, maybe. Mm-hmm. All right. Any questions? No, not right now. This was awesome. Thank you okay. so much, Matthias. You're welcome.